Welcome everyone here on Facebook. We are live from UN headquarters in New York and we're going to talk about Bitcoin. I am Hilian Dan Rosengren and I'm with the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs and I'm very excited to welcome two leading experts in the field of um, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. I'm here with Professor Ferdinando Ametrano from uh, the Università Milano Bicocca and also Professor David Jermak from the NYU Stern School of Business. Thank you for joining us. Glad to, to be here. Yeah. <laughs> to all of you who are watching us now, this is your chance to ask your questions about blockchain, uh, change, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, and the crypto economy. So please share it, your question, in the comments field below this live broadcast. We will share it with our two experts here and make sure to answer as many questions as possible during this live broadcast. So let me kick things off with a question of my own. Can you tell us what exactly is a Bitcoin and how does uh, cryptocurrency work? Well, Bitcoin, it's for the first time in digital realm, something which can be transferred but not duplicated. And this is a really a breakthrough because there has been nothing like this before. Now, since it is also scarce in quantity, well, one might uh, notice that it's similar to gold. It might be the digital equivalent of gold. And so if you think about the role of physical gold in this sort of civilization, money and finance, one might appreciate that digital gold, the digital equivalent of gold, might be disruptive in our digital civilization in the future of money and finance. How does it work? Well, it is based on this blockchain, which is a, a shared ledger, which registers all transactions, all Bitcoin transactions, and certify for everybody who owns what. That is, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. yeah, you yeah. Want to add? I think mm -hmm. Bitcoin is really best described as a computer network. It's a collection of about 12,000 computer nodes around the world, and these allow people to relay payments between each other. So there's units of computer memory known as bitcoins where any two people in the world could send one send money to the other without the involvement of a bank or a credit card company or a clearinghouse or any third party who is trusted to, to intermediate the transaction. So the real innovation here is to allow people to pay money directly to each other without the involvement of any financial institutions. It's very threatening to banks because it's not clear you need banks anymore when you have a computer network like this. Yeah. We actually have a question from our online audience. Uh, Tong is asking, for, for average people around the world, what are the benefits? One of the simple benefits is that it's cheaper to use Bitcoin than almost any other way of paying people. Um, if I pay with my credit card, which is typically what people do in the United States, there's a 3% fee in the background. And there's also considerable risk of identity theft and hacking. Bitcoin is basically cheaper and much more secure than the payment systems that most people use in the US. In other countries, the costs and benefits might be somewhat different. But basically, this looks like a very different way to pay people that is probably safer and cheaper. And also, there are scenarios where if you think about totalitarian regimes, uh, which might be predatory on the wealth of people. Well, in this case, you can easily, in a way, move your wealth abroad in a safe way. It's just with transferring a few bits. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is powerful because this is kind of uh, the, um, cannot be manipulated or censored or confiscated. And uh, if you think about gold, gold historically has had this role but it has also some shortcomings. Mm. It's weight, mm. it's complicated to move around. While going digital, you solve all these issues. Mm. Thank you, and, and, and I see her, here we have other questions. Thanks for sharing <laughs> on, uh, under this uh, live feed. We have Gabe asking, do you expect some regulation to happen? And what country entity would be in charge of that? 
Now, that's the big problem for regulators is that this isn't really located anywhere and no regulator has the jurisdiction or the ability to regulate it. Um, there are countries that have tried to close Bitcoin exchanges to outlaw Bitcoin, but the only real way to regulate this is to turn off the internet. And unless a country is prepared to cut off all communications to the World Wide Web, there's not much governments can do one way or the other about this computer network that goes all around the world. Mm -hmm. It's very clever by the people who designed this because it's designed to be beyond the reach of governments and to the most part it is. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, building up on this technical analysis, uh, there is the fact that what do we want to regulate? Because it's like when it comes to gold, you cannot regulate the chemical or physical composition of gold. So you can regulate the usage you do of something. But in that case, I'm not even sure that Bitcoin requires a dedicated regulation. I mean, if it is used for criminal activities, those criminal activities should be contrasted as we do when criminals use dollars or stocks or gold or diamonds or whatever. But regulating Bitcoin itself, well, it's technically impossible, as Professor Yermak pointed out, and it's also conceptually flawed. Like, what do you mean by regulating gold? There was a story from India just yesterday where the government's finance minister said that all illegitimate uses of Bitcoin are not permitted, which is a completely <laughs> vacuous <laughs> statement. You know, he didn't bother to say what's illegitimate. Yeah. He just said illegal things are illegal. And Governments are completely off balance. They don't know what to do about this. And I would say this is especially true in the United States where there's huge regulatory confusion and frustration. They just don't know mm. how to think about this because mm. it's really a new kind of property that doesn't fit mm. easily into any existing law. Mm. Mm. We have another question. Um, Gulsia is asking the amounts of energy needed um, the amounts of energy needed to mine cryptocurrency make it an environmental hazard. Are there ways to change methods of mining to make them more environmentally friendly? There is a huge research going on, but frankly, I'm pretty much skeptical about the possibility of making the mining more environmentally friendly. But things have been uh, required to be put in context. I mean, this is probably the consumption which is less than 1% of the consumption of the United States. Mm. This is comparable to what is used by data center elsewhere. Mm. And it is way less than what is used by physical gold mining, and it's way less than what is consumed worldwide for the printing of banknotes and metal coins. So, mm. yes, it is a concern, but it's not out of proportion, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is an area of great interest, and there is research going on. I have a doctoral student at NYU writing mm. a dissertation on this topic. But I think the entire problem is grossly exaggerated. Most of the people who mine Bitcoin go where electricity is abundant and cheap. Um, geothermal energy in Iceland was an early location, you know, and this just bubbles up to the sky. And lately people have been moving to northern Canada where there are a lot of hydroelectric dams, you know, water going over a dam that if they didn't capture the energy, nobody would. So it's not that people are opening coal-fired plants to pollute, you know, just from mining Bitcoin. Um, quite the contrary, the miners seek out exactly where electricity is abundant and cheap. And I think a great deal of context and perspective is needed before people make these cataclysmic forecasts about how Bitcoin will destroy the world's environment. It's, it's just not true. If you think about what is going on in the last few years with green energies, it's just it's like we have negative energy price. Mm. in certain part of the world, in certain yeah, moment of the day. So they pay you to consume that. So mm. hopefully, even looking forward, we might get better and better at using renewable energy and green energy. And in a way, we might, cons we, we might think that might be reasonable mm. to kind of dump the mm. excess energy we have mm. in something that uh, make a network secure. But I think the, the bottom line on the use of energy is that it's regulated by market prices. And if there really was such astronomical demand, the price of energy would go up and then fewer people would mine Bitcoin. This is a problem well solved by a free market. Mm -hmm.
good old free market. <laughs> yes. um, I wanted to share another question also. I mean, there is a lot of interest in blockchain technology. Um, what do you think are its future applications besides cryptocurrencies? Well, this is um, a not debate nowadays. My personal approach is that there is a blockchain technology beyond Bitcoin, mm. but there is not a blockchain technology without Bitcoin. Uh, intrinsically, in order to reach distributed consensus on a shared ledger, that is the consensus on the status of the ledger among distributed network nodes, mm. uh, you need something like proof of work, that you know, uh, energy consumption that we have been discussing. Mm. And so uh, it's like this can be done only if your whatever application you have for blockchain technology, in a way you anchor yourself to a blockchain which is really immutable, which cannot be altered, which cannot be manipulated. And to these days, Bitcoin is the, probably is the only one mm. that satisfies this requirement. Mm. So there are very promising applications known as notarization, timestamping, providing the, the, the data, mm. the date to some file. But notarization is broader in scope. Uh, and even you have anchoring, which means like, time stamping the status of exogenous network into the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, there are a lot of proponents that talk about private blockchain, mm -hmm. permissioned blockchain, but that is, uh, as of now, just research. There is nothing in production that can be really verified. Mm -hmm. well, I tend to agree that the public blockchain has many advantages over the private, but there actually are use cases. Um, probably the most well-known is the Australian Stock Exchange is planning to open a private blockchain next year for the entire Sydney stock market. Mm -hmm. And there are many private blockchains already being used in shipping and logistics and in small areas of the banking system. The potential, though, is huge. Mm -hmm. It's fundamentally a database technology. And I think the blockchain, you have to think of its importance in terms of before and after double entry bookkeeping 600 years ago. How big a difference did that make? I think you're looking at an inv innovation on similar scale that will probably lead to the migration of almost all government records, healthcare records, over the next 10 to 20 years into a much more secure format. And whether it's a public blockchain or a private blockchain, Ultimately, I think both are going to exist, and there's going to be you know, sort of a contest between the two models that will be very interesting to watch. But I think we're on the same page that the real benefits really would come from the public open mm -hmm. blockchains that are basically based on distributed consensus rather than some authority third party who's a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. um, and we touched upon this a little earlier when we got one, questions from, one question from the online audience, that governments are struggling to understand the potential economic impact of cryptocurrencies. Could cryptocurrencies change the way they conduct monetar monetary policy? Like I, I think very much so. And the irony of all this is that Bitcoin was really developed to put government central banks out of business. Mm -hmm but the ultimate user of the technology probably is the central bank itself. Um, every central bank in the world is looking at the possibility of recalling the paper banknotes, the coins, and replacing it with electronic blockchain currency. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if some major country did it this year. Mm -hmm. um, plans are pretty well laid out for this, and at this point it's really a political decision. And there are some very technology-forward countries that are looking at this very keenly. Mm. And surprisingly, China has also made some very strong statements using words about the necessity of doing this. So I think that the benefits of this are enormous and mm. that we will get to this point um, mm. well within our generation that most of the money in the world, in fact, will be on mm. central bank blockchains. Mm. Well, uh, ga going back to the digital gold uh, example and approach, you can think that, I mean, 1933, the United mm. States declared the possession of gold illegal. 1972, the convertibility of the U.S. dollar in mm. gold was mm. suspended. Mm. Gold has never been really appreciated because it's kind of defensive of mm. property rights and it is against uh, inflation. And mm. So these days, I mean, Bitcoin is probably scaring 
many central bankers because it provides an alternative. Mm -hmm. If you think that since 1913, the foundation of Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. the dollar has lost 96% of its purchasing power. So if you want to move uh, wealth into the future, mm -hmm. well, the Bitcoin proposition is quite appealing. Mm -hmm. And of course, government, which pretty much requires a degree of inflation mm -hmm. that is like this kind of competition. Mm -hmm. We have two more questions from the online audience, and I think we're, we have limited time. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have uh, David asking, what's the implication of Bitcoin in developed versus emerging economies? Maybe you can take one each of these. Uh, yeah. Many people thought the potential of Bitcoin really was in the developing world for large numbers of people who had no connection to the financial system. The data suggest otherwise, though. The use of Bitcoin is very much in affluent societies. Um, it has not realized the potential it has to go into sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and so forth, and draw people into the financial system. So I think that there is a lot of hope here, but not a lot of realization of the promise at this point. Mm. And um, another question from Ahmed. Can cryptocurrencies be used by the UN? to minimize corruption risks when the UN sends funds to its programs internationally? Well, Bitcoin or Bitcoin-like approaches uh, are very promising for sovereign national activities like the United Nations or International Monetary Fund. Unfortunately, I don't feel like this is going to be uh, really adopted because of, in a way, systemic risk, the same risk that we see with Bitcoin, we might see with whatever mm -hmm. is kind of so sovereign uh, asset that mm -hmm. cannot be really controlled. Or if it is controlled, it is not really a, cri a decentralized cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ametrano, Professor Yermak, for uh, joining us today. And thank you to the audience. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for watching and for also sharing so many questions. We will be posting a link under this uh, live stream, under this broadcast, where you will find more information about Bitcoin, crypto economy, and other frontier issues that you and DESA is exploring. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you.